Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting me yet again. I think it's my fourth or fifth time, and I'm very happy to also um, be invited to speak at your 10th event. Uh, I want to particularly thank Gregory for all the support uh, and the very good uh, cooperation that we have throughout the year. Um, you have asked me to speak about um, the developments uh, in Europe and how they impact on you. And I was just telling Gregory it was interesting to listen both to your minister and also uh, to uh, the supervisory authority representative because you might have noticed the majority of what they were talking about is in fact originating in Brussels. And um, to give you an overview now, I thought we talk about the current EU regulatory landscape. And um, I thought I sent you down memory lane. And we start 16 years ago. We had 12 texts that were applicable to us as a sector. And uh, when you look back then um, over time, you see how this is developing. So uh, today, we are one of um, the most regulated sectors. And when you see what is in the pipeline, it is quite impressive. Um, in fact, we are running out of space to add. Now, the surge of regulation that we have seen of course, I men uh, mentioned here some of it was um, triggered by the crisis 10 years ago. But what we see just since 2019 is really an explosion. Um, we have since 2019 30 new texts. That means every one and a half months we have a new text uh, that will be applicable to us as a sector. And that, of course, um, is a challenge. Uh, now, the recent um, avalanche was obviously also triggered by the two issues that everybody mentions, um, sustainability and digital developments. But, of course, it still means that these are all texts that need to be looked at, implemented, and worked with. Uh, and, of course, all this is also reviewed on a regular basis. Um, but this is just uh, the iceberg, in fact, of regulation, because what I showed you earlier, this slide with um, all the regulation on it, um, is the level one area. This is the area that is discussed between, uh, presented by the Commission and discussed then between Council and Parliament. But there are level two and three, and these are the areas that are then meant to give more meaning to the level one text, because level one texts are frequently very general, um, and they need explanation, and that is being done by the European Supervisory Authority. And I have put the iceberg because when you look at what it means, um, is in fact that we see um, a lot of detail and prescription coming through in level two and three. And sometimes the feeling is that the supervisory authorities are really stretching the limits of interpretation that the level one texts um, provide. Now, what are the challenges moving forward? We have uh, certainly, and I have talked about it, an increase in quantity of regulation. So from 12 to over 63 texts uh, in a number of years. But worryingly, we have also a decrease in quality. We have increasingly regulation that is presented without a proper impact assessment. For example, we are currently dealing with uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act, and we have seen that uh, there are now uh, really ideas to bring insurance into a high-risk category, but we haven't seen an impact assessment for that. Um, we are also now expecting a retail investment strategy, and other speakers beforehand talked about it, uh, but part of um, some of the proposals that will come forward are based on erroneous uh, studies, um, 
and again have been done in a way that I would say doesn't meet the quality requirements that you would expect. Um, and last but not least, we have the increasing challenge um, that we have sector-specific regulation, but then in addition, we have horizontal or cross-cutting regulation that comes on top. Now, let me be very clear, as a sector, we are obviously interested in having good regulation. We want a good framework, and this is not a plea to get rid of regulation. This is a plea to get the right regulation for this industry. And um, an example of good regulation I would give is DORA, the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Again, it was mentioned earlier. And, and this act will help the insurance sector to essentially determine how to deal with the operational risks that the digital developments bring for the running of the, com um, the companies. But now, at the same time, at process level, just after we had uh, discussions closed on DORA, there is a new initiative on a Cyber Resilience Act. Now, this is essentially doing exactly the same that DORA does, but for the entire industry. And when we noted that um, there are discussions that this Cyber Resilience Act would also uh, be applicable to insurance companies, we went to the Commission and said, we don't get it. We have DORA now, it's applicable to us. Why would we apply also the Cyber Resilience Act? And we were told that there are neither legal nor practical um, arrangements that they could think of to exclude our sector. So what it means is um, we will have to really now engage also in the discussions on the Cyber Resilience Act to avoid that there are similar but slightly different uh, rules um, that would lead to overlap and complications in implementation for our sector. So that is an example where good regulation can be undermined by, uh, you know, overlap, duplication, inconsistencies. Another example is the sustainability area. I thought it might be interesting for you just to demonstrate what insurance companies have to do now in implementing all the sustainability-related requirements, and you see that it is everywhere in all areas of the insurance value stream, in investment, in distribution, reporting, etc. And what you see here in dark are the requirements that are already in place. What you see in light green is the requirements that we know are already, um, you know, under discussion, and the light ones are the ones that are in the pipeline. Now, here again, you know, we have, of course, insolvency two already requirements to consider sustainability factors, but then we get them cross-cutting again through the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or the CSDD, the Corporate Sustainability uh, Due Diligence Directive. So this is what is creating the problem. It's not that we are opposed to regulation. What we see is all this overlap and duplication. So what are the challenges? Um, I think one key issue for us at European level is increasingly that, um, you know, through the digital and sustainability developments, we have more and more directorate generals in the Commission that are dealing with insurance without having necessarily the knowledge. Like in the past, we were engaging predominantly with what we call directorate general FISMA. They have an insurance unit, they know about insurance. But now we are dealing with more than 15 different directorate generals. You know, one for health, one for the environment, one connect, one trust you name it, and none of them has an insurance unit. So what we are doing there is explaining what insurance means, how insurance works, how it operates. So to address this low level of understanding that leads to then best intended, but not very helpful um, regulatory proposals. 
What we are also dealing with and struggling with is the read across from other regulation. Uh, the minister and also um, your representative from the financial authority spoke about the European, uh, the IRRD, uh, so the Insurance Recovery and Resolution Directive. When you look at its predecessor in the banking field, you, f you see that large parts of the banking resolution text have simply been copied across. And that despite the fact that we have at international level already developments um, and discussions that could have influenced the European text from the international perspective in a much more meaningful and targeted way. So that's an issue. And last but not least, and that is a very clear challenge, with all the new regulation we see, and this is now predominantly related to um, digital developments, what we see is that there are always risks and benefits when something new is introduced, but somehow the risks always take precedence. You know, people seem to be so afraid of new developments that, you know, the, the protection element in regulation is becoming increasingly predominant. Other challenges. We see increasingly political polarization. In fact, you know, now this year is the year before um, a European election. It's always my worst year. I tell you in a minute why. Uh, but um, first, when you think about European elections in many countries, people think this is an opportunity to ventilate frustration. And what we get is an increasingly polarized, polarized um, European Parliament, because when you elect at national level or even local level, you think about what will be the impact, but at European level it seems so far away that what we see is very frequently this frustration, uh, you know, playing out, and this will make the life that we do um, and also the work that we do at European level more and more challenging. What we also find increasingly is access to policy makers uh, becomes an issue because there are more and more um, NGO type um, engagements also at European level. So entities that work more on conviction than fact. Uh, the funding is not always very clear, uh, but because they are the good guys, you know, fighting for something that is perceived socially acceptable. There is sometimes um, an easier way for them to push messages uh, through, even if um, the foundations are sometimes missing. The, to prioritize adoptability, I now can explain why the last year before an election is always my worst year in my job, because this is the year when the European Commission can kick out um, the last parts, the last initiatives of their mandate. And what you find is, for example, now we have an Irish commissioner, um, Marit McGuinness, and she knows she will not come back but she have, has a life after commission. And what we see now is initiatives that she needs to uh, build her credentials. But this is not necessarily good because she will be gone in the next year and we will have to work with the legacy. So um, what uh, can we do looking ahead in light of all these challenges? Maybe a very short excursion in closing two different regulatory approaches in other parts of the world. As Insurance Europe, we are also engaging internationally. And we run the Secretariat for the uh, Global Federation of Insurance Associations. And what we see there is in our discussion with um, our colleagues from other parts of the world, that they tell us, you know, Europe, they are always at the forefront of regulation. They are always the ones setting the tone. And when I go to the commission, I recently had a meeting with the director general of DG FISMA, and he said, you know, Michaela, I'm so happy because when I go to the Americans now, I tell them, this is how we do it. And they say, oh, okay, we, we have to see how we follow. But you know, it's not really good for us because we are always ahead, but we are always 
ahead also in terms of intensity, prescriptiveness, detail. When I look at solvency tool, 20 to 30 percent more capital intense and volatile than um, an international insurance um, standard that is in the making and where, for example, American, Japanese, uh, African uh, insurers will only have to really get up to. So we are here, in the international standard here and the others are here. What will this do for our competitiveness in the long term? Another point on sustainability, we do all these reportings. You remember the slide uh, with all the sustainability and uh, corporate uh, reporting uh, obligations. At international level, they are running a task force on climate-related disclosure or nature-related nature disclosures, and they will end up lower than we are. What will this do in the long run? I think... Um, to end on a positive note, one thing we can do is uh, to continue to speak with one voice and we really need your support in this. Poland has a key role to play. You know, first you are a country with a weight big enough, uh, you know, in your, own, um, in your own size, but you are also a binding factor for all the Central and Eastern European countries. And we have seen in the past that this reach out can really also be very decisive when it comes to European developments. Um, evidence-based, I still believe with too many conviction-based, you know, players in the market, evidence-based is still the thing that we should pursue. And for this, we again need your support on a continuous basis. We need to highlight the insurance specifics. You know, we cannot just accept read across from other sectors, other ideas, and we need to really look at the reputational impact because increasingly, you know, I was very interested in listen, listening to the speech of the supervisory authority. You have to price well in light of inflation, but reputationally, what will this do? Because we have to reprice, obviously, that will have an impact with consumers. Um, we will see with climate change um, that insurability will become increasingly an issue. All this uh, brings reputational challenges. So we can only make the difference if we work together with one voice. And I want to thank Gregor also for the foresight of establishing an office in Brussels. This makes cooperation really very efficient and with Bartos really also being in Brussels with us on a regular basis, we can really address the challenges and I hope uh, that we can continue to deliver results because while you see that there is enough, it's still better than what was originally presented and we hope we can continue in this vein also with your support in the future. Thank you very much.